Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources on the line. I'm actually in transit myself from Wyoming down to Colorado, and um, Chris is in transit from Arizona elk hunting uh, headed back to Kansas. I've caught him somewhere in the middle of New Mexico. The last time we talked, Chris was kind of giving us an uh, update on on uh, all of the things that he had going on with his elk hunt and calling in that monster bull on that over-the-counter tag in Colorado for his for his kid friend and um uh chris last time we had chatted you were going back for one day and then you were going to head to arizona and um looks like you struck gold so i guess we got a lot to talk about between your colorado hunt and then get a recap from you uh on your arizona uh experience for the month yeah i I forgot that we hadn't even talked about that last little last pitch effort of mine in Colorado, so yeah, yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, so um, last we talked, it was in the evening. You were rolling into a spot and going to go uh, give it a one-day last-ditch effort there in Colorado. Uh, you had just called in, a, uh, uh, and, and you guys had hunted a, uh area and got that 355 bull, which is an absolute giant for public ground, you know, over-the-counter. Um, tell us about how it went down that next day. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I, so I had left Colorado. I had to take care of a few things for some of our deer stuff coming up, and so I was headed back, and literally I was just headed to Arizona. But it takes me, you know, it takes me right by one of the areas that we had hunted, and like you said, that's the same spot where we killed that big bull. So I was like, you know what, there's no way that I'm running through. Because, I, I mean, I can't complain. I think I said this last time. I, I really can't complain. This is one of the best seasons I've ever had. Uh, just from a standpoint of uh, finding, you know, really nice mature bulls and then getting on them and working them. Now, the wind completely just sabotaged every effort I, ever, I that I had in my initial hunt. So at that point, I hadn't killed anything. I'm like, there's no way I'm driving right by this spot, and I need to stop and, you know, I, I break up my trip into two parts anyway. I usually stay overnight somewhere and then, continue on to Arizona anyway, so I, so I know that I've got to stop. I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to pull into the trailhead. I'm going to grab the bow in the morning. I'm just going to hike up in, for the morning to just see. I'm just, that's all, it's just, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to hike up the valley, see if I hear something. If I hear something, I'll try to get on it. If I can, if I can kill something great, if not, then I'll just fail, jump back in the vehicle, continue on down to Arizona. So, Pull in that parking lot, I don't, or the, the trailhead there, the parking lot of the trailhead, and, and I don't know, it's like 11 o'clock at night or something. So I just crashed in the back. I didn't even pop the camper up or anything. And, you know, I've talked about it on the elk module, and I think you and I have talked about it before, too. When you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to locate animals, especially in pressured situations, I always tell people, get out there early. I mean, like two hours before even the slightest hint of, light in the horizon so i did i got up at three uh you know headed out at about three thirty, and, and got up to a really good spot to listen into a couple of just these little basins these little bowls up in the head end of this valley and i mean i just sat there sat there sat there nothing nothing nothing, nothing. i can see where this is going to go possibly well finally a little, little tiny squeal way up on the top of the mountain and then there's another little tiny squeal way up to the other head end, the other end of the valley. And then there's another little squeal over here. That, you know, so just a little bit of talking, and then right smack in front of me, down in the bottom of this bowl, all of a sudden, just this deep, just this raspy chuckle, just. Oh, oh, oh. I'm like, well, that's where I'm going. So I waited again. The wind was bad. So long story short, I had to wait until. About eight, well, it was about seven forty-five. I got myself into the basin in that little bowl, staged above that bowl, but uh, off the side where the wind was killing me, and I just had to sit there for almost an hour waiting just for the wind to settle out. Because I was like, "There's no way I'm going to let this happen again. I'm not. Here we go. I've got a good mature bowl down below me, possibly. It's thick, but the wind is bad. I'm just going to sit. And I'm going to wait till the thermal switch, and then we'll play it by ear and we'll see. We'll go." 
do there. So finally, the, the was, thermal was he started, bugling? Was he no. still periodically bugling, or just one time and you you waited? No, he no he. Was, I think maybe at, he bugled at one cow call, but when I say bugle, he was just like, and that was it. Everything else, it was maybe one. It was just a very short, raspy, deep chuckle. And he maybe did that once every 15 minutes. I mean, it was just this, and that was it. And if you really weren't standing in that bait, you, there's no way you'd hurt him. No way you would hurt him. And so the talking was very, very light to start. Once those, once the thermals shift and the, the wind starts coming up and the bulls, you know, the, all the other elk that were in that little base started getting closer to their bedding area, there was a little bit more talk. And so, and once that wind switched, I kind of got myself positioned, and, and I remember this clearly. You and I talked about this uh, before, you know, about whether you want to call a little downhill crosswise to you or call them uphill. In this case, A, the wind was in my favor trying to, you know, if I was above him. But B, they all want to come up anyway to go to the bedding area, so I just stayed myself above them and started calling. Well, as soon as I started calling, that's when a couple of the uh, you know younger age class bulls start, started sounding off, but he never did. I mean, he was he was quiet, and you could tell just by where he was and what was going. I, I knew he, there's no way at this time of the year he didn't have cows, so I was just going to play it really, really low key and just play the long game kind of, and just try to call him subtly if I needed to. Well, I got set up, and he's only maybe 150 yards down the hill. And all of a sudden, I see here comes a bull up out of the exact little hole that I just heard him in. You know, and you and I both know you, you can never judge a bull by its bugle, but you can hear those deeper, long, you know, just a deeper chesty sound. Typically, the, the deeper that is, the, the bigger the body of the animal, you know, which is typically a, a more mature bull. Well, this bull that came up out of the bottom had a really good look at bottom. I mean, he was just fat. He was he was stocky. But as soon as I saw his antlers, I'm like, nah, I don't think this is the bull that I'm after. He was just a small six. But at this point, you know, I'm, my freezers are empty. <laughs> this is the last dish effort. And, you know, if this is a satellite bull coming out of this group, if I pass this bull in hopes to go for the big one, which I could, if this wind swirls like it has... Every single time, all season long, and this bull spooks, he's going to do one thing and one thing only. He's going to just bail back down the mountain. He's going to run right straight back into that bigger group. He's going to blow the whole thing. And so I said, as soon as I saw him, I was like, no, that, that's a good enough bull for me right now. Absolutely. If, if this thing, if I can call him in and I can get him, you know, if I can get a good shot opportunity, I'm, I'll, I'll take him. Well, I call him to 18 yards. He stands there, um, and luckily, I and I did check the footage. I got it all on video, and the video came out pretty good. Um, he comes up. He's swinging. I mean, perfect. I mean, he's headed right straight to the the one doorway. I was like, it, it, he's going to be right there. That's why I swung the camera. Sure enough, he walks right to it. But he puts his head down. And he just kind of starts smelling. Like, you know, he, he's just trying to said check to see if he can smell a cow somewhere around that he's hearing. Well, as soon as he puts his head down, he, it goes behind some brush, so I pull back. But I was not in a really kind of a perfect position to shoot. That's my fault. My feet were a little just not where I normally comfortably like having them stand, so I literally shifted my right foot like an inch. And I snapped. This, this twig snapped, and it I mean, it sounded like the twig must have been like three inches of diameter. I mean, it was just crack. That bull whipped his head up. So, I mean, he just, boom, he, his head was up, and he had me nailed. He's just staring a hole, and he, but at least I was at full draw. 18 yards, quartering towards me, but, I, I mean, it was a hard quartering towards almost a frontal. But I look, I'm like, there's a hole right there. His heart's right there. I can put this arrow right there and just send it. And I shot arrow hit really sounded like a good hit and it, it, I mean, it sounded like a good hit the shot felt good but he wheeled spawn 180 and did exactly like it. he just took about 5 or 6 pounds down the hill headed towards 
that big group again, and then it just went silent. So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and I don't hear anything, don't hear anything. And I just never hear him crash, and I never hear anything. And, and of course, the elk down in the bottom of the basin is still quiet. I'm like, crap. So I figured out, I said, well, I'll give it 30. Make sure everything, you know, just, just give him 30 minutes. Then I'll go look for my arrow. Go look for my arrow. Don't find the arrow. But I find tracks. I can see where he bounded down the hill. And at about two bounds down the hill, here's blood. Boom, boom, boom. We've got good blood. So I'm confident I'm going to find this bull. Well, literally halfway through the tracking job, I mean, I just found blood. I just started down. All of a sudden, there's this bull just screams like 50 yards to my right. I'm like, holy, not knowing. So I whip around, grab the camera, get the camera on, I get another arrow just in case it's my bull coming back around or doing something. And no, nope, it's a different five point. But this five point comes in 10 yards, bugles, right on camera. I mean, he just screams his head off, comes by me, gets gets my wind, takes off, I'm like, all right, that's kind of, that's that's a good sign, we got elk in here, continue the blood trail, boom, follow down, I mean, he, he died within about eight yards, I didn't even need to wait for 30 minutes, but, um, great shot, arrow went clean through him, and went in, in front of the left, the point of the left shoulder, and literally the arrow was laying just inside the hide on his right hip. So the arrow, the arrow went clean through him. We had talked about my setup this year at the I I think that's a winner. I think it's a it's a good it's a good setup. I didn't have any problem with penetration, but why don't you so, review that if if anybody hadn't listened to that um, review what your setup was because I know you changed your arrow and your broadhead. Yeah, normally I I like a really large cutting diameter broadhead, um, and I'm going to be doing a video for the elk module talking about just from a conceptual standpoint, just the different philosophies on broadheads and, and what the strengths and weaknesses are of different design. Not trying to sell anybody on a particular broadhead, but just understand what you're going to get yourself into if you choose a large mechanical versus a small cut-on-contact fixed blade or something like that. So I've killed elk with all sorts of different broadheads. Well, this year, Iron Will Outfitters kind of came out, and, and they've got an incredible product. I mean, they, they Regardless of what kind of head did you prefer, you cannot deny that the broadheads that they engineered are just incredible. I mean, the, the, they're expensive as sin, but, I mean, heck, the, and I think I even told you guys that the the ferrule itself, just the ferrule of the broadhead itself, cost the company $10 to make. So the materials are just incredible. So anyway, they, they contacted me. We talked. They were curious that if, if I'd be interested in shooting them. I agreed simply because I've, like I said, I've killed elk with every other uh, every style of broadhead, and I've got video footage of me doing so. The only one I don't have video footage of me killing is, is with a uh, two blade with bleeder blade style head, cut on contact head. I've killed them before, but they were all throwaway heads. So I told them, I said, "Yeah, let's let's do this." I said, "I'll." I'll I'll shoot those heads, and let's, see, let's give them a test. So I set up an arrow setup this year for max penetration. So it's a heavier arrow, 535-grain arrow. Uh, the whole setup is 535 grains, four fletch, lighted knock, wrap, brass insert up front. So it's got really good FOC. Uh, it's, still on, it's about 125 FOC, but it's got 125-grain iron wheel outfitters head up front. And goodness gracious, I've seen, you know, not only did, my arrow just go literally from one end to the other on an elk. I saw a couple pictures of this year, same thing. Other people would take, you know, their split or whatever, a frontal shot, and the arrow's literally poking out their rear end or, or their, their hind quarter. I mean, dude, these heads, the, the amount of penetration that folks can get with these heads is incredible. So it was, it was for me, it was a success, and, and I'm glad we got good video footage of it. So, but... Um, yeah, I mean. So you were I, self videoing. You you shot yeah. him. You were by yourself, and you got it on video. Yes, yes, yeah. That that, that is the challenge. There's been a couple people that have been pounding me, you know, about the fact that you know it's been a few years since I've got any of my elk on camera. You know, the ones I've killed, and I trust me, I, I understand their frustration. But anybody who's going solo and 
calling solo and setting up solo and then trying to film, film yourself solo and get it all, get the elk on the ground and get it on film knows that it's, it's oftentimes not an easy task. And so these past couple years, I've killed my elk. I just have not been able to get it on video. And, and heck, even even age bull, like we talked about, the way the weather was, the terrain, and how dark it was, it just, it just wasn't conducive to video, so we didn't get video of, of Apes Bowl, but I got this one, so I should. For those people listening that have been waiting for another YouTube video, I, I, when I get home and get my deer stuff under control, I'll, I'll put together another video, so we should have another three this season uh, video on, on this year's elk time. So, so yeah, he, he was three miles back in, um, Dumped him, got him, got him. Here's the here's the thing that and and this video came out good enough where it's going to be included. I couldn't believe it. I find my bull. All right, now he and he didn't crash. He just basically ran down the hill, turned, looked back up the hill, and I think he just fell right over. But it was all soft dirt and grass, so like, there was no. I mean, I just didn't hear him fall. Well, he only made it like 80 yards down the hill, tops. And it's just steep. So, I mean, 80 yards straight downhill, I mean, that's just mostly gravity. So, I start processing this bull. I get, I, yeah, I get my pictures. I start cutting them up. I get halfway, about halfway through cutting up this bull. All of a sudden, right down below me, this deep, raspy chuckle. And he's literally 60, 50, 60 yards right below me in the carcass. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I whip around, I look, i just in time to see a cow coming up, and she's headed right to us. I scramble, grab the camera, whip it around, and, yeah, that big honk, and turns out he's a big, giant 7x7, seven seven, probably mid-340, easy, if not, to 350. Walks right up, yep, walks right up, 15 yards, stands there, looks. <laughs> I'm like, well, so you're it is what it you're is, on the carcass is. videoing this seven by seven. Yes, I'm. I'm lit- and in, in part of the video, you see me. There's the carcass. I pan over, and the bull's standing there, you know, peeking under the brush. Now, yes, he's only like 15 yards, but I'll tell you right now, at that point where I was sitting, there was no shot opportunity. So even if I had just been sitting there with no L, I would have I would have had to have been in a much better position in order to, to capitalize on that. But I just kind of thought it was just sitting this year. How many mature bulls I got on every single time the wind would switch at literally the most perfectly wrong moment. And here we are. I, I kill about a three-and-a-half-year-old bull. He hits the ground. And then the five, you know, it, probably an eight-year-old bull walks up and stands 15 yards. And the wind's perfect. The wind is absolutely perfect. Not a, not a swirl, nothing. The wind is just pounding me in the face. I was like, that's it. That's it. So, but yeah, so I get that thing all cut up. I get it shuttled down to the creek just to get it, you know, well, actually, I stashed it in the trees first. Went back. I took a load out, grabbed my pack frame, and then just went to the task of, you know, shuttling it down to the creek to get it cooled off. I was, now, folks know that I have horses, but they were still in Kansas. I've got a couple injuries on our horses where we decided this year we weren't going to stress them too bad until. So, I had another friend out there that in, in this area, he's like, oh, yeah, if you get anything down, let me know. I'll bring my horses. I'm like, right on. I've got a short amount of time, so I'll give him a call. We'll just get the horses in here. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that didn't happen. It was long, yeah. Anyway, that whole elk, that was the second elk that came out on our backs this year. Um, and because I was racing, trying to get the meat out of the hills because the bears were getting you know, I got the first couple loads out just fine. I went back in for that third trip, and a sow and cubs had found it and yanked it out. And they, again, just like they pulled, they pulled it out. They, they This time, she just pulled it out of the creek and started eating on it. They didn't eat that much. I think I caught her just as she had pulled it out. So didn't lose much. Uh, she didn't mess it up badly, but she didn't leave either. And so there's one of those situations where you go, okay, well, I took both front quarters in one load along with the antlers. Uh, a kid that it was, you know, the, the one that was going to bring the horses, he said, well, I can't bring the horses, but I'll help you. So he grabbed a hind quarter. We hiked out. 
and then we came back in that late, you know, that next morning, grabbed that last hind quarter. So we got her all out. But, man, that's two elk on my back this year. And I think those are the first two bulls that I've complained. I mean, I've, I've carried quarters, you know, shut them to the creek or shut them to places where we can get the horses to them. But this is the first first time in about 20 years where I've carried an elk all the way out on my back. And this year was two, two of them. So I was You're a too when old I, when for I that. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, actually, I said, to be honest, to be fair and to be honest, you know, the, the thing that was awesome is the first couple trips, the same thing with Abe's bull, and, and with this bull, I was like, man, I'm, this, is, this is doable. I can, I can do this. this we're, we're rocking. Well, that's if you're taking a quarter at a time, and, and you know, you're, you've got a, you know, 40, 50-pound pack, but then, we, then when you stack two front quarters in with the antlers and your pack's over 100 pounds, then you're like, okay, this pretty much sucks. So, <laughs> yeah. so I, the, old so go, I got, the old go in light, come out heavy is great until you have 100 pounds on your back. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then you realize, ah, oh, crap, that's three miles. That's like, yeah. that's like three miles. That's like all of three miles. <laughs> yeah. And but for those no, of you that are in their, tw- those of you that are in your twenties that are smirking right now, just saying, yeah, yeah Jay and Chris yeah. are getting old. Just wait. All I have to say is, just wait. Just, just wait. Well, it, hey, just wait. Number one. Number two. Do not let your youthful fitness slip away from you. Just it's it will. I'm telling you, it's easier to maintain than it is to let it go and then try to get it back especially when you get older. It, 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 a, it is a nightmare to try to get it back. Just maintain it. But, yeah, keep, keep laughing now because it, it will catch up to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so is the, the elk set the process are all cut up. I'm, I'm literally headed there now to pick it up. I told them I'd just pick it up on my way back through. But as soon as I got that done, uh, wrapped up, I, I, it's when I headed straight down to Arizona. So you were going to spend um, the month in Arizona. Uh, you've spent the last couple of uh, Septembers in Arizona in Unit 9. Uh, what were your overall impressions uh, when you first showed up there? What, what was different? What was the same? Kind of what were you thinking, and then how did it all transpire? Well... The first part I've got to qualify is this year, you're right. I, the past several years, I've spent all over Unit 9, whether that was that year with you and, you know, we, you know regardless, I've been all over Unit 9. This year, I had a little bit of a different focus. I came out. I was going to help uh, a couple friends of ours. They had some clients. I was going to help them out a little bit. And I also wanted to kind of see a little bit of you know, We've always talked about the in Unit 9 in North edge of that unit borders the Grand Canyon National Park. And because that borders that national park, you can imagine those animals know darn well where that park boundary is. And when the pressure hits, especially those mature bulls, they will fail and make a make a beeline for that park. And I mean they'll stand a hundred yards off that fence line. You can call them and they'll come up and they'll look and they'll walk right to a hundred yards of that fence line and they'll look at you, turn right around and walk, but they know exactly where they're safe. So I was kind of curious to see how, I, I wanted to kind of capture some of the, that, that dynamic from, you know, when the initial pressure hit to when they all bail into the park, and then the differences between behavior in the park and outside the park. They're the same animal, but just what happens in between. Well, because I killed my elk, because I had to pack it out of my back, you know, the, the season this year started, I think it was on the 15th down in Arizona, well, I killed my bull on the 14th, and so it took me three days to get everything wrapped up with my elk and then finally get down there. So I missed opening weekend. I, I, essentially, I missed the first four days. When it all came to set down, I missed the first four days of season. So all I had to do is, I, all I could do is really rely on their, their reports and, and what they saw and heard. Um, but when I got there, oh, and, and then the other thing, too, is so this year I stayed in what I would consider that north north one quarter of the unit, what what most people talk about the big pines. So from west to east, I covered a little bit of that, but I stayed in that northern one quarter of the unit. So I really don't have 
any information on what happened in, you know, say the south or the central portions or whatever. I've been anecdotal stuff from what I've heard people talking. But my my report this year is just just from what I saw in the mines and along that border. Um, but I listened to your podcast with Steve Chapel, and he, I mean, he's dead on. I mean, the, the forage production in there this year was absolutely incredible. I mean, just. Just grass upon grass. Just, I mean, places that don't want to grow grass, they had grass growing on them. I mean, it was, the amount of food that they had available to them was incredible. Uh, the amount of water that was still in there, even though they had dried out for a while, was still really good. So if I compare and contrast what I saw last year, last year I was hauling, for, for my client, I was hauling water just to keep elk in a, you know, somewhat of a, of a, a generalized pattern where we knew the heck they were going to be. So I was hauling water last year. Well, this year there was water in places where there was no water last year. Um, which, okay, so now you've got food. And so as soon as I saw that, you know, again, Steve said it, I show up the first day, I go out there and I look around, I'm like, yep, that's what's going on. So initially my thought is, okay, there is absolutely no rhyme or reason for any of these animals to be anywhere other than wherever they want to be. They can be scattered everywhere in this place because there's food and water to cover everywhere. It's only going to be whether or not the pressure, I thought, whether the pressure was going to be enough to, to create a change. Well, I still haven't, you know, you and I texted back and forth. I still want to go back and, and see what I said about last, what we talked about last year's Gina 9 report because I seem to remember us talking about the fact that this year we were going to have a lot of bulls of a very similar age class. And that's exactly what we had. Uh, there were some absolute giants in the unit this year. And from an antler standpoint now, the antler quality, there were just, I mean, all the, all the bulls were able to grow incredible antlers this year. I don't think there was any limitation. Uh, whatsoever. So whatever that animal had on its head was probably the full genetic potential that that animal grow in a season because the, the, winter, the winter wasn't bad last year. They had ample forage and then they had good spring rains. They had good summer rains. I mean, there was just no reason for them not to have their full set of headgear. So there were some bulls that, you know, I know for a fact there was a couple bulls in the 380s that were killed. There was a, several, several bulls in the 360s who were killed. We killed one out of our camp. Um, several 340s to 350s killed. So just good, solid bulls were killed this year. But I will say where I was, and I know for a fact that I am not the only one saying this, it was probably one of the worst bugling season I can remember. It was dead. And here we are, the season started on the 15th, it goes to the end of the month. Everybody was just excited about this is going to be an epic year. This is, I mean, the season dates are awesome. There's no season in front of, you know, the archery season, so there's not going to be that pressure. It's just, it's just going to be awesome. Oh, it was off the, the, the quality of bulls and the number of bulls that were around. Oh, it was. It was off. Awesome. But trying to find, a, I, I, I joked with some friends of ours out there, it was, this year was like a giant game of whack-a-mole. You literally get out there at 4 o'clock in the morning. I mean, the bull, you, you'd, be, you'd get woken up a couple mornings, 3 o'clock in the morning to 3.30. There would be a little short spike in bugling. And then from 4 to about 6.30, 7 o'clock, you wouldn't hear a peep. Not a, I mean, like crickets. And then maybe if, if you were in close proximity to where those bulls wanted a bed, you might get a small, you know, just a real half-hearted, real low-key, just a, you know, kind of a bed of bugle, just a, ow, just a squeal, and that's it. All of a sudden, some guy, you know, over here, he'd be like, oh, my gosh, I got in a bugling fest this, today. He goes back there the next day, it's crickets. And then all of a sudden, somebody over west of me, like, oh, my gosh, they're screwing on top. Next day, crickets. And I got into a couple of those little pockets from time to time. 
and literally it was just, and I got great video footage of this year of a real nice, big, mature bull uh, breeding a cow right in front of me, probably 20 yards in front of me. And that's what it is. You, you get these spikes in googling activity when a cow either came into asterisk or if two herds just got a little too close to one another. But I really think because of this even age class that we've got, you've got a, just a pile of bulls in that five to six, maybe seven year, you know, seven years old age, you know, age class range. They're all evenly matched. They're all equal antler size. They're all equal body size. And rather than seeing a preponderance of, you know, you got one big bull with, you know, 20 cows and a couple satellite bulls, it was exactly what I see in a lot of the over-the-counter units in Colorado. It's one bull, four cows, one bull, six cows. This one's got, oh, he's got eight. Wow. All right, now that the next one's got five. That one's got three. There was a nice probably 323-30 bull that was absolutely locked down with and, you know, trying to defend, if you will, a single cow and a calf. He had a cow and a calf, and that was, he was happy. His, I mean, he was, oh, that was, that, those were his legs. So, it was interesting. It, I, it was very interesting. And then the other thing we had was really crazy weather. Storm front after storm front after storm front coming through. Real bad winds, winds out of weird directions, swirling winds that were bad. And so I think the barometric, and, and the reason why I say I think the weather had a factor, because literally, again, I was comparing what was going on in the park with what was going on outside the park. The park was the same way. I mean, the park was dead. You, you, you could barely even find a bull that wanted to bugle inside the park. It was crazy. So I think the the age class ratio changes have had an effect. I think the weather had an effect. And if you want to talk about it, and this is the other thing too, is I really like I'm 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 absolutely waiting for you to talk to Steve. I never got a chance to catch up with Steve down there to find out what he saw or heard. But because um, I know they were running all over that unit looking for for bulls for their clients. I am uh, I am very interested to see what other folks heard and saw prior to the season starting because, again, we've got a couple individuals that are friends of ours that live right there, they're locals, that were out there from September 1st through the 15th and then beyond, and there was actually a heck of a lot of bugling activity and what typically people call a quote-unquote rutting activity the week before season. And I got questions, and I know you and I talked about this, you know, how many times I got questions this year about guys in Colorado that were panicked because things seemed to be happening early, but they didn't understand why. Well, I, again, I only have a small, tiny little piece of the unit to compare from, so I may be completely off base based on what other people saw in other parts of the unit, but it would not surprise me if we did not have cows cycling a week or so early this year for a variety, for the, for the same reason we talked about earlier, about the fact presence of mature bulls, body fat of the cows, um, synchronized esters. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things that can pull in a cow into esters early if the conditions are right. And this year in Unit 9, at least on that northern half or that northern quarter, that northern band of the pine, absolutely every one of those conditions is met. So... You don't think at all that it's a... You don't think at all that it's a situation where um, they're going to go crazy now in that muzzleloader or that early rifle season and they're going to really over the next we'll 10 see. days, get really cranked up? I mean, you think it's done? We're going to find out. And I'll tell you, I mean, obviously here we are talking about podcast. I will be shocked if it turns loose. If, if it cranks, if all of a sudden this next week it just comes unglued and they are screaming their heads off, I will be surprised. It, it will surprise me. Yes. 
I talked to a friend of mine, Dave Martin, um, who's been going up there for, you know, 15, maybe even 20 years now. He goes to Unit 9. Um, they set a camp. He, you know, he helps people, whatever. He's got friends that draw tags. And he said yep. on the bugling, he said it was a, a on a scale of 1 to 10, it was about a 3.5 this year. And he said that the antler growth was very nice, but uh, there was not a lot of bugling like normal. Um, and I was just maybe thinking that, you know, it's going to be late this year. One of the things that he was saying is because it was a dark moon, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but it was a dark moon roughly at the beginning of the hunt, we were all fired up that, you know, it's not going to be yeah. a full moon, it's going to be a dark moon. And he was thinking that possibly that dark moon, and Dar even talked a little bit about it when I talked to him on the phone, that he actually felt like that dark moon, um, that they were just, it didn't uh, it didn't have them up and moving around at night. It didn't have them go going to those congregation areas. And they were feeling like it, it you know, it didn't happen yet and that, you know, um, it, it's going to get better and better and maybe be kind of one of these, you know, first week of October, just, you know, crazy fest. Um, so it'll well, be interesting to see how that shakes out. Um, you know, yeah, we, we, you, we thought by having a dark moon, it was they were going to go nuts. But, um, you know, one thing I always say is, you know, in those bright moon periods, those elk go crazy at night. And while sometimes, you know, our hours of trying to get at them because they go to their bed so early, we think, oh, the ruts, you know, it's going to be a tough hunt because they bugle all night. You know, what's the question is, what would be better, to have them bugle all night and have, you know, at least one solid hour in the morning of just chaos? Or is it better to have dark moon and kind of have sporadic bugling? Well, and and I, I understand, yeah. Yeah. Um, two things that, that I, my thoughts, number one, um, I was always getting up really early, and where I camped this year was next to one of those areas where they usually all come piling in at night. It's usually a bugle fest. The thing is, is those animals were there, and I'm talking like multiple bulls and large groups of cows. The problem is, is, is the bugle fest happened at 3 o'clock in the morning, or between 3 and 3.30 in the morning, when those animals turned and started to, to start to move back up the mountain, it was a bugle fest in the dark, but as soon as, and, and, it, and it wasn't every night, but as soon as they got kind of over towards the timber and started up that mountain, it was done. And so I could get on those. I mean, I knew where the elk were. You could hear them, okay, boom, I get up. Well, it's pitch because there's no moon. It was just pitch black. And you know with all the, you know, they do the prescribed burns. They've had some wildfire coming through there. And so there's a lot of, you know, in some areas it's nice and clean and just open grassy parks. Other areas it's just a, it's just a jumble of dead sticks and nasty. And most of the time that's where they were out feeding. So trying to get and shadow them, get it close in the dark and shadow them, was, it was pointless because the groups were just really loose. They were you know, you'd have stragglers, you know, two, three hundred yards from the main body of the group of animals to where you'd start to sneak in and you'd bump somebody and they'd send the whole thing cascading away. But I could find them in the dark and they would talk in the dark, but it just, it was not, they were not cranking. The only conversation was to happen, it was just these real light, you know, half-hearted bugles just to, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you're over there. Yeah, I'm here. You're over there. And now well, we're we're gonna go this way. Okay, we're going this way. And then it was it. Done. Done. Um, and I don't, I don't. It would. Well, I, I say, I guess you got two things going. When you're talking about the rut, again, you got to make sure we're talking apples to apples, because there's people that say the rut, and they mean actual breeding, and then just people to talk about the rut, and they're talking about people. I, when I say, you know, when you ask me, do I think this next week it's going to come unglued and, and they're just going to start going, I don't think so, 
But when I say I don't think so, I don't think they're going to be doing that from a standpoint of cows coming into estrus and all of a sudden it just whips everybody into frenzy and, oh, baby, here we go. I think if there is a spike in bugling next week, I think that spike will come because all the bulls are done breeding their cows and they're out there going, there's got to be more. You know, I, I think if we see a spike in bugling, it'll be because bulls start cruising trying to find that last cow in, in asterisk. Now, that, for a hunter standpoint, that might be, I mean, from, a, from the muzzleloader standpoint, oh, my gosh, that might be ideal because you might have bulls now off on their own, cruising, looking for cows. You give them a cow call, they run you over. I had that happen to me a couple times this season, but that was last week where all of a sudden you get a bull that's off on his own and it means you, you make two cow calls and just, Get out of his way. You know, here he comes. I don't, it would not surprise me if we see a, a short spike in the bugling activity, but I don't think we're going to see just absolute rut frenzy. I think it's already happened. I think it's already happened. But it'll, okay. be, it'll, well. be, it'll be interesting to see. You're absolutely right. It'll be interesting to see. And, and talking with our Forest Service buddy of ours, um, you know, he lives right there in the park. And or just outside the park, and he works back and forth between the two. Um, he said it, it was just that place was just cranking that first week of September, and it was cranking early, and then it just shut down. I so, so we were talking. I said, "Well, keep tabs on it because I want to know." Because I told him, I said, "If we," he, he wanted to know if he goes, "Well, what you know? Are we going to see another big spike maybe later on at the end of October or something?" I said, "Well." We might, but I don't think it's going to be from, you know, cows that missed their, you know, uh, say a cow came in asterisk, there wasn't a bull around, so she missed, okay? They're, all the cows have ample body condition. Every cow in there has got to have 9% body fat or better, or probably much better. Every calf I saw was huge. I never saw a single spotted calf, small calf. Every calf was huge, big, fat calves big, fat cows, so there's nothing to keeping those cows from cycling on their first ester cycle like they normally do. doesn't matter what the weather's doing. The photo period drives that. So they're going to they're gonna cycle when they're going to cycle. So given how many bulls we've got in there, given the fact that there are, a lot of them are broken up in these smaller groups, I don't think we're going to have any cows missing an ester cycle. They're going to they're gonna cycle into esters, and they're going to get bred boom, right then and there. The question is, is whether or not some of last year's calves, those yearlings, whether they start cycling this year. They very, We very well may see some yearlings cycling just because their body condition is so good. But I would not suspect that to happen until maybe in October. So I think we could see a little short, and, and, it, and it's going to be hit or miss. I think it's going to be a little short spike that are random, just like I said before. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. All of a sudden, one pops up over there, and then one pops up over there, and one pops over there. And if, if you've got a team of guys, you know, like your buddies here you're talking about, like Steve or, or you know, any, any of the, you know, the outfitters or, or folks that were down there DIY, DIY hunting with a bunch of guys, you know, or gals there helping them, if you've got a group of guys out there helping you, you've got eyes and ears across the landscape, you can capitalize and jump on that a lot easier. Me being out there just by myself, man, it, it was sitting there looking at maps, looking at water, looking at sanctuary areas, going out at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, standing there. I mean, literally yesterday morning, I, that's part of the reason why I left when I left. I, I needed to be back this weekend, but I was actually thinking about staying all day yesterday. I bailed yesterday afternoon because I literally, well, um, I, I don't want, I mean, I, yeah, I'll be fair to the, all the guys, I won't start naming places and stuff, but there's a, you, you and I know it very well. Uh, there's a place right there on the park boundary. There's a couple of them, but there's a place on the park boundary where there's a couple water sources right on the fence line, and it doesn't matter if the elk are on the public side or on the, on the park side. A lot of them will bed in sanctuary in the park, but they will come out and get water on the public and they will go feed on the public because the, the fires and the forage is better on the public. So that fence line is just ground zero for a lot of guys that want to hunt it. 
but you can always, always go up there, stand on the fence, and just listen to them screaming. I went up there yesterday morning, got up there, I'm standing in the dark, pitch dark, stays ready at 3.30 in the morning. I didn't hear my first bugle until I think it was like 6.30. Crickets. I mean, just dead. Dead. But then sure enough, boom. There's a bull, there's a bull, there's a bull, there's a bull. Oh, here's one right here. Boom, 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 boom. Call him right in. Bam, bam, bam. You know, probably 320 bull out cruising. Boom, here he comes through. Right back, right on by, by me. And he ended up going back further into the public. It was literally about a 15-minute window where you're a bugle, 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 bugle. Done. And that's it for the rest of the day. So, yeah, yeah it, it, was, so, uh, it was an interesting year. With this age class where you're saying you've got quite a few of that six-year-old type bulls, are you optimistic for next year that there might be some, you know, that next that next bump up in, in antler growth as far as, you know, when you start getting those older bulls, um, do you think we're going to see a nice year next year? If we could have the same moisture year, everything oh. the same, do you think next year will be great? It all depends on what happens in those late season hunts. But let's let's just dream a little dream. Now, anybody who's listening to this that has a late season tag, I'm sorry for my next comment. I hope they don't do well in, their, in the late <laughs> season hunt. If we let, now I guess I can't say that. If if, if let, I guess let's take a step back. Again, we had some smoker bulls running around antler quality wise. Just some smoker bulls running around that unit this year, which was awesome. If a good number of those older age class bulls survive, and we get a fair number of the middle age class bulls survive, we know we're going to harvest uh, you know a fair number. There are a, a bunch of younger age class bulls that are up and comers. So I see kind of two things: if if, they, if the state keeps the stinking late season hunt tag numbers. Reasonable. I, I can't even say low. Just not what they used to be. Just don't hammer the bejesus out of your your bulls. But depending, you know, the tag numbers are what the tag numbers are this year. So depending on what harvest did this late fall and winter, if we get the moisture cycle that we had this year, oh my goodness! All right, you're gonna you're gonna have a unit nine like the old G9, where there's going to be 370 to 390 bulls. I'm not going to say running all over the place, but I I think we're going to have a really great antler potential for next year. I mean, the, 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 like I said, you when you went out and called, and you called in a bull that was a herd, he was a 340 to 360 bull. I mean, they were 340 to 360 bulls were I won't say a dime a dozen, but that's the bull you ran into. You know, you'd run into a 320 year bull, you're like, oh, ah, nice young bull. There he goes. I mean, everybody that I saw that was, most most everybody that I saw that was successful was harvesting animals in the high 340s to the low 360s. And those are great animals. And again, they're on the five, six year old age class. So you bump those up another couple years, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see many broken points at all? You know what? The last few days, the season, I, ch- I went around and I checked game cameras uh, for an outfit, a friend of ours. Yep, Yep. That last few days of, of the archery season, I almost every camera, yeah, you can, I, can't, I can't say almost every camera, on a lot of them, yes, broken, 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 broken. So that right there tells you they're, they are engaging one another they are right. you know competing but it's not it, it's not fired up i mean it's not you don't have it i did not i only once one time when i when i videoed that bull that herd bull breeding the cow only once did i get in a situation where there was a herd bull with a bunch of cows and satellite bulls every other time it was one bull a couple cows one bull handful of cows one bull a few cows that was that so, yeah, I, I am very, very interested in seeing what uh, 
what Steve saw or hearing what Steve saw or some of the other ones. But it, it's nice to know about Dave, you know, confirming the same thing that I saw. I know where his camp was, so he was south of me. <coughs> so if he was here in that south, and I think he was hunting west as well, if he was hearing that kind of activity going on where he was, then it probably was like that across the bulk of the unit. Yeah. What's next for you, Chris? Headed back to the house. Uh, it, it's it's white tail season, brother. I've got to get uh, game cameras up. I've got to get tree stands up, ground blinds in, machine lanes ready to go. I'm gonna. Oh, thank the Lord, we got a bunch of rain. So all the stuff that I planted, that I was, you know, I planted it just dusty, dry dirt. So we've got a little over an inch of rain on everything up there, and it should have come. Uh, over a couple days, so it should be a good soaker. So I'm anxious to see if my food pots are popping, but we might get that Genesis no-till out and put in a whole bunch more. We'll see what the harvest looks like. But from here on out, brother, until literally the first week of January, I almost every day is going to be consumed by whitetails doing our deer management or hunter management. So Good you stuff. Well... Um, it's always awesome having you on the podcast. I'm glad you got a last day bull and nice one at that, uh, and, uh, fill the freezer and had a good year in, in Arizona. Um, every year is a little different. Uh, I hope the listeners can take some of Chris's information and process it and help it, uh, help themselves learn about elk. And Chris, I always appreciate, uh, your insight and having you on, uh, of course, row hunting resources, the elk module is a phenomenal resource for the elk hunters out there. I uh, want to give you a chance to let people know how they can find you and how they can follow what you're doing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, just Roe Hunting Resources, R-O-E Hunting Resources, and the website, obviously, but we've got the YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook. Um, yeah, a- anywhere you want to try to find us, we're probably there. Just Roe Hunting Resources is where it's at. So. And, yeah, anybody that's got, you know, if you saw... And, I, and I'm still, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I'm still fielding questions on it. If you feel that things happened early for you in your area this year, again, there's that eight-part series, that rethinking the rut. Go through that again because there's a there's only one factor that's going to push elk to cycle late. That's body fat. There's all sorts of factors that can actually pull elk to cycle a little bit early. So review that. And then you could use that for your planning for next year. Awesome, buddy. Well, um, have you already started looking forward to next year? Oh, yeah. I, I, as bad as it was, I mean, it's, and I, yeah, it's funny. You know, you've been down there. And anybody that elk hunts, you know, you, you talk about, oh, it was a bad year. Uh, well, a bad year in elk hunting still beats not elk hunting. You know what I mean? So yeah. even though it was a rough you know, a rough go of, of getting footage this year. I didn't want to leave. I was like, man, I just there's just something about being out there. So, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I'm excited for our white tail season this year. But if I could just like fast forward and just go, okay, elk's done. Bam, white tails. Okay, that's done. Okay, let's just jump straight to turkey. Turkey done. Yep, awesome. Right back to elk. Let's just let's just point 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 just just bounce between season and season. I I think I totally do it. Yeah, for sure. I'm with you. The, the summer leaves a little bit of dead time, for sure. Um, what are you talking about? Chris, You're out there fishing your brains out all summer long. <laughs> yeah, but I, I always say fishing's just a just a way to get you through hunting se- from one hunting season to the other hunting season. But uh, That's um, fair yeah, so well, buddy, travel safe and uh, thanks for your thoughts and uh, God bless. And uh, we'll be chatting at you. Encourage the listeners to go check out Real Hunting Resources. Uh, the website, also follow Chris on his Instagram, uh, and look forward to seeing your whitetail stuff, and I uh, hope you guys yeah. knock some good bucks down. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll be starting that new whitetail series on the YouTube channel, too, so keep, keep, keep that in mind. So Cool, man. All right. Thanks All for right, having buddy. me on Take again, care. and uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. All right, buddy. Bye.